So Thank we you. shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Kamla Rasi, who is our senior consultant ophthalmology at ophthalmologist of the Eye Foundation Group of Hospitals, based at Coimbatore. She's a superb surgical trainer and a great teacher to the postgraduates and the fellows who work with us. She would be presenting an interesting case. On to you, Tamil. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Just a minute. Keep yourself loud, huh? Yeah. Thanks. Dr. Tamil just played. Yeah, it's just played. Yeah, it's moving. It's playing. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Tamil, the voice is not coming. You need to enable the share sound. Can you just stop for a minute? Yeah, yeah, just a minute. The voice is not there. Just a the minute. sound is not coming. Just can you just stop for a minute? Yeah. Because, uh, just just click share. the share screen. Just share screen button once. At the bottom there is something called share sound. Just click on the yeah. share sound. Oh. Do you want Mr. Sunil to open your video? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sunil, can you open? Your video? Good afternoon to all. Cataract surgery in pseudoexfoliation eyes can be very challenging. This is the right eye of a patient with hard cataract, pseudoexfoliation, and small pupil. AC was very shallow uniformly throughout, and biometry showed ACD of 1.35 mm. We planned for small incision cataract surgery and explained the possibility for the need for an alternate eye well. The pupil was dilated only on the day of surgery since the AC was very shallow. I could see more than 4 clock hours of zonular dialysis nasally with anterior subluxation of the cataract. My plan was to remove the cataract atraumatically without damaging the corneal endothelium and plan an alternate IOL. After making the temporal sclerocorneal tunnel, further surgical steps and maneuvering of instruments inside the AC was extremely difficult because of the shallowness. I attempted to do rexis and with much difficulty I could complete it. Care was taken throughout not to damage the iris or the corneal endothelium. Since the cataract was very hard, I prolapsed one pole out of the bag using bimanual technique. Once it is completely prolapsed out of the bag, I ensure to inject adequate viscoelastic below and then above the nucleus to protect the corneal endothelium. I confirm the adequacy of the inner lip to accommodate the hard nucleus and delivered using a vectus. The nucleus was really hard. Once the nucleus was delivered, I cleared the anterior chamber of the loose cortical matter and then I could see the bag was crumpled. I decided to remove the bag. I felt iris fixation is a good option and it will provide good long term outcome. After removing the bag, I noticed minimal vitreous disturbance and I decided to do an anterior vitrectomy. A thorough anterior vitrectomy was done. After completing it, the iris clip eye is introduced into the anterior chamber and the one haptic is taken behind the iris. The eye is slightly lifted in order to appreciate the contour of the claw and a gentle pressure is applied on the slotted center of the haptic using a spatula. The same maneuver is repeated on the other side. I confirm the eye enclavation and the viscoelastic is removed completely. I sutured the tunnel and intracameral antibiotic was given. Side ports were hydrated. Postoperatively, the patient had an uncorrected visual acuity of 615 and the best corrected visual acuity of 66. 
This is another patient with severe phacodenosis and pseudoexfoliation and deep anterior chamber. In such cases, examining the patient in supine position is indicated to plan the surgical approach, whether anterior or pass planner. Rarely, the cataract may dislocate posteriorly and better managed with pass planner approach. The cataract was removed through a temporal sclerocondyl tunnel and the iris clip eyeball was enclaved to the mid peripheral iris as in the previous case. The tunnel was sutured. This is the post operative picture. The take home pearls are pre op exploration is really very important, timing of cataract surgery is critical. Asymmetry of the anterior chamber depth indicates zona weakness. Address small pupil and never do small rexes. Ensure to protect the existing zonules and the endothelia. The apex study, that is the Erwin pseudo exfoliation study, rules out the indication of CTR in uncomplicated case of PXF without zonal weakness. Ovalization of the previous round rexes indicate zonal weakness. The degree of zonalopathy and patient's age decide whether we need a standard or a modified CTR. The APEX study again indicates minimal need for altering an implant choice in uncomplicated PXF cases. Single piece IOL is preferred for gentle hand folding and three piece IOL is preferred for rigid haptics and it can be placed in sulcus with optic capture to prevent pseudophacodonosis. Post op look for early capsular phimosis and treat it with YAG relaxing anterior capsulotomies. Thank you. Thank you Tamil that was so complete. I'm actually stumped about what questions to ask. So let me try and I'll expect uh, Dr. Deepak and uh, Dr. Saurabh and Dr. Debashish to uh, bother you some more. So one thing is that, do you think in your first case, had you used uh, capsular hooks, you could have salvaged the capsular bag? Would that have? Um, actually, the case, the patient had a severe PXF and I could see that anterior subluxation nasally. So while doing rexes only, it was very difficult and it was like disproportionate. So I thought um, salvaging the bag would have been really difficult in that case. Now, uh, one other uh, important uh, question is, uh, do you believe that uh, you have to alter the size of the incision uh, if it's a more subluxated uh, cataract? Because my SIC's experience is not much. So. No, and the size of incision is truly dependent upon the uh, how we are going to deliver the cataract and the grade of cataract. If you're going to uh, bisect the nucleus or use a loop and uh, the incision size, we can uh, reduce it. But if you're going to deliver it as such, then we have to make sure that the inner lip is adequate for that cataract uh, to be delivered atraumatically. Now, you the other thing, the... uh, uh, no, Chitra. Last question I have is, uh, to the speakers here, would you all think of uh, uh, suggesting a CTR to be used regularly for a premium IOL or a toric IOL case? Uh, or would you use it only if it is an obvious, uh, uh, obvious subluxation is there? Yeah, uh, the Chitra, to answer your question, you know, uh, as I told you, the economics uh, play a, a, a big role here. And uh, you know, if the if we uh, if the patient is for a PMMA lens, uh, one thing that you know in Tamil's case, uh, I would say that it was the disproportion of the nucleus to the rexes. You know, though she did it very carefully, and it was a very big rexes. Yet it was the bulk bulkiness and the entire. Um, um, bigness of the, the back fullness of the nucleus that extended maybe the, the uh, whatever zonules were there. So essentially the other thing is an envelope capsulotomy or even a can opener capsulotomy. So where you let the capsule be free, I mean the entire capsular bag being free and just place the lens in the sulcus. And of course the only thing that you need to do is do a very uh, careful uh, cortical cleanup because uh, you don't pull the tags. So uh, that's another quick way of solving these uh, complicated cases. The other one is, of course, the way Deepak did, where you take absolute precautions that nothing goes wrong uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, and of course, we have so many other bailouts, uh, the way uh, the Irish claw lenses, the uh, scleral fixated, externalized, uh, the glue diodes, uh, so there are, uh, one, even if the capsule goes, there are so many other ways to uh, put in a lens. So uh, this uh, 
quicker bailout is that, uh, but it all depends on how you approach a particular case, depending upon uh, uh, the um, what the patient uh, is willing. Doctor Doctor Parikshit, you want to say something? Uh, I would not use a CTR in every uh, this, only if the subluxation is more than three clock hours would I think of putting in a CTR. Otherwise, no. Just a point here, ma'am. Uh, just yeah. because there has been a paradigm shift in the way we are dealing with these uh, 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 subluxated or loose zones in elderly patients. Yeah. I think what Dr. Tamil showed was, you know, more of us are now using iris claw lenses. Yeah. This was not so much talked about four or five years back. So in these elderly patients, now I'm not going blue lenses or scleral fixated lenses in these eyes. I'm going on just like she did, you know, iris claw lenses because uh, it's the ease of use, the swiftness of the surgery, and it's very traumatic. Yes. Just wanted to ask a question. My experience is limited. I've been using for maybe two, three years, that's all. Have you noticed uh, any difference in the amount of uh, cystoid macular edema in these cases no. uh, over a large period of time? You see, maybe about uh, more than I 50 cases. We do a very good number of iris fit lenses whenever a secondary IOL has to be placed. And I believe that whatever CME is, is because of how complicated the primary surgery was. In a neat, complete, regular case, uh, iris clip lens gets fixed in so miraculously and fast that there is no CME at all. So in my study, which I had found out, wherever we have used the secondary as a secondary lens, where the eye is quiet and everything is settled, the incidence of CME was almost nil. Mm -hmm. But in a case where we use it as a primary device in a first complicated procedure intraoperatively, we have incidence of CME, but I can't attribute it to the procedure or to the lens. I can't sure. But definitely there has been paradigm shift now. More of us are doing to the uh, iris claw lenses than the time-consuming sleeve and fixated lenses. That has been a clear shift. Dr. Ravindra sir is here who has had immense experience and we have learned a lot from him. Uh, yes. He has been a great proponent of using these lenses for many years now. Yes, Dr. Ravindra, can you tell us? I would like to uh, congratulate uh, Tamil Nadu for excellent surgery. Yes. Well, the only two points I would like to comment is she started Rexis from the dehiscent area. So that pulls the dehiscent area and uh, I would like to come start the Rexis from an area which is far away. As Dr. Deepak said, the uh, Utrata forceps gives much better control on the rexis tear when compared to cystitome in cases. You can start with cystitome, but then you can, but you start in a case, in, in an area where you're not going to pull the zone use. That's one. Second is, uh, I would never put the wire vectors into the capsular bag till the nucleus is completely come out of it. So the mechanics, you know, if you can imagine the capsular bag, and if you want to put it there, there will be a lot of stress and stretch on the zonular back. So in both the cases, I think you put the uh, wire vectors, uh, you know, when the half of the nucleus was still inside. That's, I would not approve. And uh, what Deepak did is he enlarged the rexus. That's the, probably the best way to handle it. So make a very large rexus. What does rexus do? There is no additional tear of the zonules. In this case, you could have easily managed to put a lens inside the capsular back without losing the capsular pack. That's, that's, it's a possibility in SICS. So, uh, because there are no extraneous forces uh, playing around in that area. About the, uh, about the iris claw lens retrofixed, I think that's a boon for uh, so many cases. And uh, we uh, recently analyzed, after the uh, you know, dialogue, we analyzed our own cases, done about 15 years. Last 15 years, I've been doing retro iris claw lenses. There's not one case of the lens induced or, you know, the, the causative factor being the surgery, there's not one case of CME. There's no CME at all. So it's a false, uh, you know, uh, saying that retro iris lenses are tumulant postoperatively and that causes CME. CME causing mechanisms are totally different. So it's the lens is not the cause. Thank you. I think we have three more speakers, so we should... Okay, here's... Just Professor. one point regarding the progressive nature of these uh, zonulopathies, like particularly PXF, we see a lot of PXF patients. Yes. And though we can manage, like Dr. Deepak showed in his uh, case, that we can manage with the lens in either in the sulcus or in the back, what we see over a period of time, after four or five years, many of these patients come back with subluxated IOS. So I think nowadays, uh, many surgeons like uh, Dr. Tamil Rasi has rightly shown has shifted to either iris claw or SFIL. 
so i feel if you want to put a lens in the bag you fix the bag on both sides because i have done this mistake i fix the bag on one side after four years it doesn't happen immediately and of course these patients are old so if they live for next four years they will come back with subluxations so you have to either fix the bag on both sides or you go ahead with iris claw or sfil so iris claw is i think wonderful tool and uh, we have all learned from dr ravindra's videos he does it beautifully and it's uh, uh, i had also that you know inhibition that uh, we are attaching something to iris which is moving but uh, i think it does wonderful job i think that is the lens to go for in such cases yes 